Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, today I'm talking about uh, bicommutin categories. Uh, this is joint work with Andre Enriquez, and the notion of a bicommutin category is due to Andre. It goes back uh, just a few years, and um, in particular, I can I'll talk about a little bit about some of the motivation of this and um, this idea of a, a categorified von Neumann algebra. So just a little bit of, um, let, let me give you, we'll start off with the analogy table, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Andre's original motivation for writing such a thing down. So we'll do this here. So on one side of, of this diagram, we're going to have algebras. On the other side, we have tensor categories. OK? So a tensor category is a categorified algebra. I think you know, Tobias gave us, uh, had a nice joke, which was, what is categorical? Well, I can apply this to categorification. You know it when you see it, OK? So, Tensor category here, we have, sorry? Oh, well. <laughs> okay, so algebra, we, we can add, we can, we can multiply tensor categories. Have, we have notion of direct sum, we have a notion of tensor product, and then when you take, you know, like the growth and geek ring, we, we recover actual and honest algebra back on the nose. There's a notion of, if we're looking at finite dimensional here, this is the notion of being fusion. Okay, or finitely semi-simple. The idea is there we have finitely many isomorphism classes of simple. So here's just, I'm going to go, this is the rough analogy table, and I'll talk, you know, I'll give some precise definitions later. So the notion of a center of an algebra. And over here is the notion of Drenfeld center. This categorifies the notion of center. Um, put this back right here. There we go. All right, and then there's the notion of a centralizer as well. So here, if I have you know a inside b, I can talk about the centralizer, which will denote uh, z sub b of a. Okay, or for us, if you're thinking of a Neumann algebra, you're thinking a prime intersect b. Over here, there's a notion of relative center. And here, maybe you're thinking z b of c. Okay, so this is the, the rough analogy between Algebras and tensor categories. Now, when we want to pass, this is going left to right here is categorification. We're now going to go past to the infinite dimensional case, okay, into the, into the world of von Neumann algebras because that's what we're interested in today. So, here we have the von Neumann algebra B of H. The categorical analogy, now it's an analogy, and it's not really categorification, but the idea is that you should think about BIM R. This is the category of bimodules over R. R is well, for me, it's the hyperfinite 2 1 factor. For Andre and for his motivation with conformal field theory, it's the hyperfinite 3 1 factor. So all of, our pr all of our proofs actually are just independent of whether you're type 2 1 or type 3 1. It doesn't matter. Um, so I like thinking about 2 1. So to me, it's 2 1. Okay. So you're thinking of all the bimodules, not just bifinite ones. Okay. And, and we're thinking about separable Hilbert spaces there. So now, if I have a subalgebra, Inside of B of H, this is just you know of any subalgebra. Here we need to think about we take a some tensor category, and we represent it into BIM R. Okay, so we have some some tensor functor from C to BIM R. This is like represent, representing your algebra in Hilbert space. Okay, so now we can think about the commutant of an algebra A prime. Well, here it's going to be the relative center inside BIM R of C. And here I'm suppressing the alpha, but always you're taking a representative category and taking its relative center, okay? And finally, we have the notion of a von Neumann algebra, right? If you are your own double commutant, well, the notion, the correct notion here is that C should be equivalent to its bicommutant here, okay? So here, I'm gonna write alpha C prime. Here it should be equivalent to your bicommutant and um, more on that. I'll actually give you the definition, okay? Later. That's what we're going to do today. Today we're going to have a concrete one. Um, but um, really, you, you actually do need this alpha because the type of thing that the commutant is, you actually have to forget in order to take a, a double commutant. So you need to talk about representation. It's, there's no way around it, really. Um, but it's just a technicality. You can think about it as being an honest just collection of bimodules, and that's what I'll do today. Yeah? 
Absolutely. Okay, so, right, let's get down to it. Let's talk about the, um, what's the setup here? So, pro uh, yes? C prime is in BIM R. Yes. So you're thinking of C inside BIM R, and you're taking the relative center. Yeah. I'm going to tell you everything. This is just the beginning. This is the warm-up, the appetizer. <laughs> We're now getting to the actual, the actual story. Okay. All right. So, right. So, what is for us? What does it mean? Uh, and actually, so we're going to be studying fusion categories. In fact, unitary fusion categories. Let's use the following definition: a unitary fusion category is <laughs> it's a subcategory of BIMR on its Hilbert spaces. Okay, such that. Okay, we're going to say, first of all, there's a finite list, 1, C1 up to Cn minus 1, of irreducible bimodules in C up to ISO. Okay, so there's only finitely many irreducible bimodules in C up to isomorphism. Two. It's going to say every um, every x in C is a finite direct sum of irreducibles. Okay, we're going to call this list here. This we're just going to fix this now. It's going to be ir of C. Okay, just we're going to work with the finite finite fixed list here. Three. It's going to be closed under direct sum. Here I'm going to use box times. Box times always means um, fusion over R, the relative tensor product. Taking sub-objects and taking conjugates. Okay? And four, um, well I guess that's really it. That, that's, that's all it is. Um, sorry? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're taking, I mean, you're, it's, when I say subcategory, I mean take all the, all the maps. Yeah. Okay. So in particular, every C and C is dualizable. Okay. So here I have, you know, this guy C dual, and C dual comes with canonical maps. Here this is C, C dual C. This is the identity here, and similar for right. So, any questions about our definition of unitary fusion category? It's all okay. Great, fantastic. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the relative center here. Okay, so I'm, our C that we're working with is actually living inside BIM R. The objects are just they're, they're actual Hilbert spaces. So we're going to call this um, C prime. C prime is a tensor category. Well, it's a category whose objects are pairs x, ex. So here, you know, this is like capital X. I'm always going to use like A, B, and C for objects in C, I'm using X and Y for objects of C prime. Okay, so X is just, X is going to be some bimodule, it's just some RR bimodule, and EX is a family of unitary half radius. C. Okay? So what does this mean? It means that you have a, this is my X, this is C, and this is EX comma C. This is an isomorphism from X box times C to you know, C fused with X, isomorphism. Okay? And this has to satisfy some relations. Um, uh, 
which I think uh, I think we're mostly familiar with the reactions for half-rating two. Or I'm gonna maybe I'll I'll say a few of them. There's a there's a uh, here. Well, let me tell you what the morphisms are, and then I'll tell you some actions here. Uh, morphisms. Morphisms here are the F taking x to y such that they're compatible with the half ratings. Okay, so here we have, um, right. Actually, let me let me tell you a little more about these before I go on to the morphisms. I, not, let, me not, not, let me not rush it. Let me actually tell you what these things are. Okay, so these things are required to be natural. What does it mean for them to be natural? It means that for every F taking C to D in my category, right, for every intertwiner, I have that the following few things are the same. Okay, so this is naturality of, of the half braiding, and they also have to satisfy the hexagon axiom. Okay, this is like, um, what is this? This is saying if I take, I'm going to just draw it out basically. If I take the half ratings for C and for D, it's the same thing as, well, I can do them at the same time. What I can do is, I can move C over to D, move this one. Okay, so here I'm drawing the associators in here. And then there's another associator. Okay, so this is a hexagon axiom. There are six maps in this in this equality. Okay, so now what are the morphisms? Okay, so F is a morphism from x e x to y e y. If okay, so F. First of all, it's a map, it's a bimodule map from x to y, but it has to be compatible with the half braidings. Okay, so here I have f, there's x, there's y, there's c. That has to be the same thing as f here, x, c, y up here. Okay, so that's what it means to be a map in this central in this uh, in this centralizer. Okay, so wonderful. This is a tensor category, all right. So it's the same. I mean, if you if you know why the center of a category is is a tensor category, I mean, you can see why this will be also be a tensor category. Um, you just define the tensor product in the usual way. Okay, so um, right. So I said that uh, you can't get by without representation. The idea is that if you want to take another commutant, right? Then you have to forget these half ratings and then think of them as bimodules and then take a commutant of that category. Okay, so you, you have the commutant does something the same flavor as C. Right? It comes with this representation here, C prime, and then I have to forget in order to take the bicommutant up here. Okay? Which is also comes with a natural forgetful functor here down to C. C is C is included naturally inside C double prime. Okay? So Natural inclusion, C into C double prime. And so to do that, I have to tell you what is for each C and C, how do I commute it with X in C prime? Well, I just define that to be in this way. Okay. Uh, C prime is comes represented on Denmar. Its objects are bimodules together with unitary in these unitaries. And so you just forget you just get the honest bimodules back. Yes. Not really full. Okay. 
Actually, I'm just writing it as like you think of it as sitting inside the house. Yeah, I'm a No, no, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have. That's right. I, I shouldn't be putting this in the. That's right. No, I'll. I'll just you know. But this is. Yeah. Um, but here I'm good. That's right. You forget a lot of things. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely, and this happens. This happens a lot. Say, take the center of categories like, you know, Kambari Havana, what have you. You have the hash ratings for the same group element. Um, okay, great. But this is, this is what we're studying here. And um, our goal here is to actually come up with examples of bicommutant categories, okay? So what are, are there, are there bicommutant categories? And it's important to mention here that, um, so there's this algebraic fact, right? If you take one commutant and take three commutants, that's the same thing algebraically. But with categories, there's no algebraic result like this, okay? It can fail. So um, th these aren't things that you just you know, get for free. You have to do work and to come up with examples of these things, okay? So today we're gonna actually construct examples of bicommutant categories from a unitary fusion category. So just want to say a few words about Andre's original motivation for defining such a thing. And that is coming from conformal field theory. In particular, he was thinking about um, solitons. So you take the conformal net A, Uh, it's, that's, a, that's an equivalence. Yeah, so it's where C is equivalent to C double prime. And that, that natural inclusion is actual an equivalence of that. So, equivalence of categories? So, you, mm -hmm. um, it means that basically it's saying that like there's a unique way to endow each one with a hash rating with different intercoms. And that the maps are the same. That's right. Yeah, it's a very special thing to be equivalent to C double prime. Like. Okay. So the idea is what Andre was thinking of is is you take your conformal net and now you're looking at representations where, I guess. He takes out one. I mean, as uh, Roberto drew this picture the other day, right? The stereographic projection down here from looking at your conformal net to, you know, looking at your net on on the real line. So you take your conformal net. You're looking now at representations where um, let's compare. Um, actually, we're taking out minus one here. Well, whatever. So now we're we're moving minus one and looking at representations here that are compatible with the with the structure here. And so this these form a tensor category. TA, and so what Andre was proving is that rep TA, or uh, sorry, TA, what was this? The center of TA is equivalent to rep A, okay? And this was, uh, and also that TA is bicommutant. So this is in his preprint. Uh, what does, the, basically he's where he's studying, you know, what does churn Simon's theory assign to a point? Okay, so this is some of the original motivation. Um, but also, this is gonna tell us a lot of, we, we've, we've proved some really nice things about bimodules, uh, and so you're really learning a lot about dim R in the process as well. So, great. I mean, right now, I think we're more in a phenomenological stage. We're trying to, you know, get our examples in order. You know, all these examples you can think of maybe, you know, type one examples. So there's there's a lot to do in this in this whole regard, and and so I think we're we're really just starting to we're scratching the surface with our examples right now. Um, okay. So great. 
in order to actually, we want to show, we want to say, okay, here's the theorem. Let's see, your unitary fusion category. Okay, and we think about C as, you know, just coming inside bin Mora here. One, C prime is by commutant. And two, that means C double prime in is, is as well, and we can describe C double prime. It's, it's, this category, C tensor over Beckwith filled. Objects in here look like, the, the underlying bi modules in here look like direct sums of HC tensor here with C. Okay, so here is just a, some Hilbert space. And then C here is some object in our category, okay? So that's what the, the thing looks like here, okay? So I think, um, another way to say this is like uh, the Neshve of Yamashita in that they were dealing with, right? I think this should be the same thing, okay? So, um, so that, that's, that's the, uh, the theorem that we're gonna talk about today. So in order to do this, we're going to introduce a graph, the graphical calculus that allows us to actually get a handle on C prime, and that's really the, that's really the start of it all. You have to get a handle on C prime. So what we do is we pick orthonormal bases for our spaces C, A, B to C, and we're going to denote these by tri trivalent vertices. Okay, and uh, today I'm actually going to use the Snyder Convention, Noah Snyder Convention, originally introduced in Maui, which is I'm going to ignore all scalars. I'm just going to ignore them. This is, you know, an advertisement really for the paper, and so um, I don't want to get lost in, you know, all the, the, the quantum all the quantum dimensions and everything. I'm just going to draw the pictures, and that's going to be basically the intuition for what's happening here. Um, so, well, here's the, no well, and just as I say that, I'm going to actually tell you a normalization. <laughs> Got to tell you a little bit there. We're going to normalize, so, um, if I, here if I take alpha, here I take beta, here is C, here's C, here's, I guess this is beta star, here's A, here's B. Um, we're going to set this as equal to, that that's the one we're going to use, and where DC, dimension of C is this closed loop, okay? conjugate. All right, so now I have relations that are going to be really, really useful for this, for the rest of it, and I want to write them separately in a place where I'm not going to erase them. So this is going away. Wonderful. So what are the relations? And now We're also going to um, introduce another notation here. So that is, there's a canonical element where I sum over a basis and it's dual, right? So if I do something like when I sum over, say, A, B, C, A dual, B dual, C dual, and here I'm summing over alpha, star here, um, that's really, uh, anyway, um, if I'm summing here over alpha, this element here is independent of the choice of my orthonormal basis, okay? And so instead of actually writing the sum or anything, I'm just going to write this in this way. I'm just going to ignore the summation, I'm just going to, to draw this with a pair of nodes here. Sometimes you might see more than one kind of node in the picture, in which case I'm going to color in the nodes that you should be summing over together. Okay, so you might see some pictures where you have multiple things. It just means I'm summing over a basis and it's dual. 
in, in certain parts, okay? So it's kind of, you know, just an Einstein notation. Nothing, nothing too scary here, okay? So the first relation is the bygone relation. Okay, so if I have alpha, I have beta, and this is, these, are all, these are all my simples here, A, B, and C here. They're in error of C, okay, here's C, here's A of star. This is, you know, again, up to, again, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding all of the, uh, all of the scalars here, so up to some scalar here, this is just delta alpha is beta, right? So this is just, that, that's the first bygone relation, okay? So the second bygone relation I mean, you can think about this in another way. If it says if I do, um, what am I saying here? Sorry? What am I saying here? No, this is just, you know, I've got an inner product here of, of, of orthonormal base of, of this Hom space, and this is my inner product, and, right? So since C is simple, this is just some map from C to C, right? So it's a number, so it's something times, you know, the identity. Figure out what it is. It has to be. Um, yeah, you can put a different C at the top and the bottom if you want to, and then you have to say, well, delta C is D as well. Yeah, so I can, if you like, I can make a D and. Yeah. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write another one, which is more the way you use it. Okay, so the, the way you use this typically is that. If I have some diagram like this, and here I'm summing, um, this is the same thing as summing here, and I'm tying some deltas, right? There's some, some, some Kronecker deltas that are out here, right? That basically make everything the way they're supposed to be. Um, that you're supposed to have everything match up here and here, and so you can basically, you're when you pair these off, the only way is that it's happening is if you're getting the identity here. Okay, so there's some Kronecker deltas here, which I'm also leaving off here. Yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I could do that too. But you can always see things in pairs. But yeah. Oh, well, it's a, uh, so I haven't been labeling here. Here you could write A and B, and here you can write A bar and B bar. Every time I see a pair, they have to appear basically in its dual. Okay. Or B bar, A bar. I think it's B bar, A bar. Problem is, yeah. Okay. So my notes are a bit sloppy too right here. Um, all right, so the, there's a fusion relation. So these are bygone relations. There's fusion which is if I have A and B, I can write this as, here I put C in the middle, okay? And here, again, I'm at A and B, okay? So here this is alpha and this is alpha star, okay? Um, that's a pretty common one. That's one that we're all familiar with. And the last one that's important is I is H. So the I is H relation is, This is equal to okay, and this is just saying that you can, and this is this is like your your six J symbol type thing. You're just changing bases from one to the other, but instead of here you'd have to deal with six J symbols if I only did one of them. If I do both of them, they're the same. Okay, so the normalization. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm totally leaving out all the normalizations because I'm just going to plan to use these and show you a little taste of how all these um, calculations work. Okay? 
So great. Using these relations, we can write down an induction functor from BIM R to the commutator. What's the induction functor here? So what we do well it's it's like the, the it's basically exactly like the induction functor going from C to Z of C um, that comes from Muger. What you do is you take your X in Bim R, it's gonna map to the direct sum over C and R of C of C x, c dual, okay? So what you think about this graphically is you have a string, here I'm gonna do a curl, uh, you know, a, a wiggly string, that's x, and then what it's going to go to is x with c and c dual on either side, and here I'm summing over my c, okay? So that, that, that's the identity morphism, that's how you would represent that. And now you have to, these have to come with a half graded, right? So I have to give you a unitary isomorphism, okay, from this used with any other object of, of C to moving it to the other side, okay? So I have to give you E delta of X A should be an isomorphism from delta of X fused with A to A fused with delta of X, okay? So to do this, we're going to use the graphical calculus, and it's the same formula that you would get from the induction functor. The idea is it's as follows. Okay, so that's the map. Okay, so that's the, that's the half rating. Now, first of all, I want to show, I'll prove to you that it's unitary, okay? And since here I'm just defining it for A simple, because um, you're only defining on the simples, it's automatically going to be natural. So we have to only check that it's unitary and that it satisfies the hexagon axiom. So why is it unitary? So unitary is the following calculation. So I get I have this type of diagram. And what I do is I end up using this relation right here. See that this is the same thing as this. That, again, we're always summing. And now I use my fusion relation. And I get that, okay? So this is the, the proof that this defines a unitary, okay? So compose it with its adjoint, I get this. Um, What's the hexagon axiom? The hexagon axiom is exactly I is H. So how does that work? Well, I have to do, um, This is one of the ways that you can compose, th this is one of the, the, the sides of the hexagon axiom. And the other side is just when you apply ISH, you get the following. Okay, so this is here, here's A and B, and here is, you know, AB, but you have to, decompose into simples in order to, to use the half rate. That's the definition. So, right, that tells us that, and now it's clear that this is a functor, right? Um, if I have a map, say, from X to Y, it's just, it, it doesn't see this stuff at all. It can just float right through, okay? So, this is an induction functor from BIM R to C prime. Um, well, it, it's only because you only define it on simples and then you do everything else additively. So. Right, so. 
Okay, so a, if there, so the point is A is simple, and so if I have a map from A to anything else, that means A is actually injected into it. It's just a, you're just doing it for simples. I mean, it's, and it, it's extended additively. It's the way that you would cheat in order to define it. It's not cheating, it's actually perfectly simple way. But it's, it's basically the same definition as the induction functor. Um, okay. So the next thing that we want to do, I like where am I in time? I have what? 15 minutes? Well, 13 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So what we need to do is we we want to be able to compute the endomorphism algebra of of this delta of x, okay? That's a, that's our next task. So I'm going to compute and in C prime of delta of x, okay? We want to know what do the morphisms from delta of x, what, what do these endomorphisms look like, okay? Well, in fact, there's a really nice description which brings us, you know, which we're making connection to um, the tube algebra. Basically, these look kind of like generalized tube algebra type things. So what's, what's, happen what's happening here? Given a family of maps, so, FA is going to be some map here from, say, X. So if I have some bimodule maps from X tensor A to A tensor X, so here I should think about F. This is F. It's got some squiggles going this way, that way, A to A. Then we can actually get an endomorphism as follows. We set TF, we can find TF in and C prime of delta of X by the following. I take F, okay, it's got these strings here, and I do that, okay? So here I'm summing again. Here I have C, X, and dual. A, here's B dual, here's B, here's A, okay? Okay, so this gives you an actual endomorphism in C prime. Why is it actually in C prime? Well, let's do that calculation to show that this actually is an endomorphism. So that's just, if it has to commute with the half braiding. Right, that's what it means to be an endomorphism in C prime, a bimodule map that commutes with a half braiding. So, how do I have this instead of this? Well, and it sees the I is H relation and it moves up the other way. So this TF that we've written down commutes with the half braiding, and so we get actually an element in NC prime of delta. Now, if I have a T in NC prime of delta, well, from this I can get some family of maps F sub T as follows. Well, T looks like something like that, and we map it to What's the eighth component? Well, okay, so you do that. You're again summing because here this is going in and summing over to C and C dual. So you sum over that, but you fix your A's and that gives you your eighth component in F sub T. Okay, and so the proposition is really that these are Basically, if you that this is a this is a complete description of NC prime of delta of x, okay, 
it's it's this is this map here is 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 bijected. And uh, that's a nice calculation, but I've done a few of these calculations already, and um, perhaps I won't do that one. Yeah, I'll, I won't do that one. Okay, so what's the whole point of doing all this? The point is we need to get a handle on C prime, right? That, that's the idea. We need to really get our hands on some actual concrete elements of C prime in order to get a handle on what the, what the braidings are going to be, right, with the half braidings. Um, from C double prime. So to do this, to really get a handle on the on the half ratings, we use the notion of an absorbent object. So so if D is a tensor category, we say D and D is absorbing if D tensor X is isomorphic to D is isomorphic to X tensor D for every X in D. Okay? So um, if, if D is a, uh, right, if, if D has bools, then you see that in fact, D isomorphic to D tensor D dual, right? And that's isomorphic to also D dual, so that any absorbing object here has to be self-dual. And if you take, say, X, if you're if you take X to be one direct sub one, then you'll see that D is isomorphic to D tensor one direct sub one, which is D direct sub D, okay? And so you see that this object is really it's infinite. And it's going to be an infinite type of object. Okay, so let's talk about in the context of BIM R what our absorbing object is. So BIM R has an absorbing object. It's just the infinite direct sum of the course correspondence. Okay. So that's absorbing in BIM R. And if you're in, in three one land, you don't need to take the infinite direct sum. You just take L2 R prime for L2 R. Okay. So why were we doing this whole business about describing the endomorphism algebra in C prime of delta of X? Well, it's the following um, theorem. If lambda is absorbing in BIM R, And delta of lambda is absorbing in C prime. Okay, so C prime admits an absorbing object. Okay, and this no C is a Cauchy type. Horribly big K. Yeah, but and that's why it has these big things that absorb. C actually C won't have an absorbing object, but the C tensor over vector hill will have an absorbing object. There, it's like um, you take little L2 tensor C and sum over that for the irreducibles, and that'll be absorbing inside C. Okay, so if you're thinking about this, you say, you know, looking at, say, rep G, then something like the Fell absorption principle, right? This is like that kind of. Yeah, okay. Um, right, so, but what actually makes this so strong here, not only this, we actually, in order to prove this, we use the following fact, which is quite nice, um, in fact, if lambda is absorbing, then nc prime of delta of lambda is a factor. 
Okay, and so this is actually a very important fact that goes into this theorem, and uh, there's a, a nice trick to prove this fact. Um, and you know, since today is the subfactor day, uh, you can spot that subfactor now. Turns out there's a subfactor around. So this isn't really an aside at this point, but um, the aside is here. There's a subfactor. take end in bim r of lambda, that's a factor here, right? It's an two infinity factor, and it includes into end t prime of delta of lambda just by applying delta, okay? And so what subfactor is that? This is a quantum double subfactor. Um, okay, so in just the last few minutes remaining, I just want to kind of tell you how the um, how c prime how how we use this in order to get what c double prime is. I want to tell you the, the steps that go into proving the main theorem. Okay, so okay, what? Oh no no, the main theorem was that uh. The theorem was C prime is by commutant, and thus, you know, so is C double prime. And sorry, in BIM R, I, to be by commutant means that you're a category where if I take that's when you take, when you, when you, yeah, when you, okay, so what was the definition of by commutant category? It was, it's a category together with a representation where the commutant is equivalent to the original category. Sorry, the by commutant is equivalent to the original category. Here I'm talking about C prime. It's a category that has objects and hash ratings. No, when you embed C prime into BIMR, you forget. So you forget, but C prime is this abstract thing. It's got hash ratings. You forget, now you're in BIMR. You can take commutant. That gives you something else with hash ratings. You forget, now you're back in BIMR. You take its commutant again, you're something else with hash ratings. There's an equivalence between the thing with hash ratings that you started with and the thing with hash ratings that you got. C is not by commutant. It's this C box time. It's that's part two. C double prime is equivalent to the C tensor over Beckwith build. Okay, this in thing. That's the thing that's by commutant, right? Because you can always take you know infinite direct sums, and that'll be in the com that'll be in the by commutant because you're looking at all by models, right? But you don't get anything else, right? Only only the things that you expect to get there are what's there. Yeah, maybe, I, you know, is it, is it okay with the, 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 the forget? That's the point is you can't get, you can't get around these having representation because you have to forget and that gives you the representation, right? That's the, you, you have to, you have to have representation. Um, okay, so really the point here is that, um, well, I have one last minute here, but let me tell you the three steps. So first step is, The underlying bimodules of an object in C double prime. So I'm, 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 I'm here, I'm explaining this part to you. Um, an object in C double prime is an object in C tensor over Beckwith build. Okay, so that the, the the, uh, the bimodules themselves look good. Now you have to deal with the half ratings. Uh, two is any half rating on an object in C double prime is uniquely determined
by its half grading with um, an absorbing object. Okay, so the existence of absor absorbing objects tells us that we can characterize the half gratings. And finally, you have uniqueness every object here in C double prime has a unique half rate with an absorbing object. Okay. So that's, those are the three steps of the proof. You put those three things together, you get that C double prime really is this thing that's not supposed to be bigger than you think it should be. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>